I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of what we do at Temple Capital, um, which is a hedge fund that trades crypto such. Uh, we use Julia. Uh, brief context for those of you who are familiar with Julia and not hedge funds. There's this like, the goal is to make money. Uh, and so there's like, you buy things, you sell things. Uh, if you buy things and sell things and then you make money, that's called alpha. Uh, that's in contrast to beta. If you just buy a thing and hold it, that's beta. It's like correlated with the market as doing what the market is doing. So you can think of returns as alpha times beta or plus beta times X, where X is what the market does. Um, Sharpe's ratio is another cool concept. It's the ratio of how much you make to how much volatility there is. So if you've got a Sharpe's ratio of a gazillion, it means you're making money like this. And if you've got a Sharpe's ratio of zero, it means you're making money like this and not actually making money. So like you want a high Sharpe's ratio. Um, yeah, uh, and for folks who know statistics, um, if you take a bunch of things that have say, I don't know, an average of one and a standard deviation of 10 and you average them together, um, then you'll get something with an average of one and a standard deviation of, and you'll know, uh, it could be 10 if they're all very correlated, or it could be very low if they're uncorrelated. So anyway, not much audience interaction. Disappointing. Um, uh, a little note on beta. So like if you're buying a thing and holding it, like you buy the S&P 500 and hold it, then you've got to have the money to buy the thing. And there's a cost of funds there. If beta is negative, you just sell the S&P 500 and then hold it negative, then you've got to you have extra cash because you sold the S&P 500 or you need to borrow the S&P 500 somewhere. Anyway, um, if you've got a bunch of strategies on the same index and they all average a beta of zero, then they're kind of half buying and half selling all the time. So the cost of funds isn't an issue. And what this means is you can average a whole bunch of different strategies as long as they all have beta zero, meaning the average net zero buying and selling. And the more uncorrelated things you average, the lower the standard deviation, the better the Sharpe's ratio, the happier the people are. Um, also, the title of this talk, Beating the Market, beating at this kind of clickbait there, because if beta is zero, you're not really playing the market. That I mean, you're like playing buying and selling and such, like playing the market, but you're not invested in the market. So it's not like you're buying the S&P 500 and doing better. It's a, it's a separate thing. And if we look, take a step back at the whole like uh, concept of averaging uncorrelated returns, uh, it's very good that this is a separate thing because that means somebody who's already in the S&P 500 might want to invest in a hedge fund too. Okay, so that's hedge funds for folks who might not be familiar. Uh, and this is how you do it, ah, trade secrets. So first you come up with a bunch of different strategies. Um, how do you know which ones work? Uh, uh, you probably don't. Uh, then you test them on old historical data. Now you do know which ones work, uh, uh, maybe, or maybe they just used to work and they don't anymore. So then you like test them on medium historical and pick the good ones. And then you test them on the latest data and you pick the good ones. And you're not just picking, picking the best ones. Take all the good strategies then make sure you're picking uncorrelated strategies and average them together. Uh, huzzah, now you have a strategy that's even better than all those things. Um, and it turns out that like, if you wanna make a trade, you click a button on a computer. Uh, and it turns out that we can do computer programs that can do people, that we can do that stuff cleverly. And so we can automate that and we can automate the automating of that and we automate everything and so on and so forth. Cause computers are free and people are expensive. Um, yeah, uh, oh, side note, uh, it turns out if you just like scale up your compute over and over again, it stops being free. Um, Temple realized this a bit ago, uh, decided to hire some people to, uh, try to work on that, uh, try to get the computers to be free again. We're working on it. <laughs> They're still not free, but doing our best. Uh, there are hard things, um, Two algorithm problem. Remember this uh, step one, come up with a bunch of strategies. That's got to be quick to develop. And then deploying them, uh, that's like running them live, 
trading all the time, just doing all the strategies that we've ever came up with that worked at the same time. Uh, and we want to be able to get good results quickly before the market moves. So it needs to be quick to develop and quick to run. Classic two algorithm problem, or classic two language problem. There's also a two algorithm problem, backtesting and live evaluation. It's very different uh, problem domains. If we're running something back testing, we have all the historical data. We want all the signal, all the returns that we're getting. We want to see how our strategy performs. Whereas live, we get one time step at a time, and we need to low latency get how to trade from that. Um, so two different algorithms, and it's so important that they're the same. We can't have a strategy that's like, ooh, this back tests really well. And that's like, oh, the live implementation is different and doesn't do well. Like that's totally not okay. So we, from a performance perspective, we should really split these into two separate algorithms, but we just can't have bugs that way. So that's a tricky thing that we've got. Also like if, if people are like, oh, we should run more experiments, we should do more things, computers are cheap, right? Then we end up pushing the limits of what we can get with the computers, and that runs into like exotic hardware issues, out of memory issues, scaling, communication between threads, between processes, between computers. And uh, when you try to push things to the limit, things start falling off and when it's like oh i found a bug on this hardware and it costs a hundred dollars an hour to run the hardware it's like who's going to debug that bug for us i don't know so that's one tricky thing also uh we do everything on aws we do everything through remote machines i was just at the pluto workshop yet earlier today and i was like oh yeah it's a little bit laggy because I click something, it goes to AWS, so in the US, and then comes back, and it's on my screen. It's like everything goes through remote, uh, through a remote connection, and that's a, a tooling thing. And I'm going to finish on what uh, things that we get in support from the community, from the Julie community, and things that we look for. Um, IDE support for editors and notebooks. We use a lot of editors and a lot of notebooks. This is something that is pretty good and could always be better. Um, exactly reproducible numeric results. Remember how I was saying that like the back testing and the live need to be the same? That's very important. We don't want like a little bit of floating point error is really not ideal in that because when you have a bunch of compounding error, like I don't want to be modeling that. I just want it to be bit reproducible. And so things like, uh, at SIMD instructions in base functions can be troublesome, but we can just use math mode IEEE, it'll be fine. But that's something we value. Um, and serialization, because we're communicating across computers and across time, we need serialization. And that needs to be robust to updating Julia and updating packages. And so that's a, a lovely thing that we want and need and that Julia offers some of. Um, and of course, low memory consumption, high performance. So that's all I have to talk. I'm happy to answer questions if there's a bit of time for them.